protection. Sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high, greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance, and his appearance beyond that of sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see. Those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, no appearance that would attract us to, us, to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins, Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shearers. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked in a burial place with evildoers. Though he had done no wrong nor spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush his infirmity. If he give his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendant in a long, time, a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore I will give him his portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death, and was counted among the wicked. And he shall take away the sins of many, and win pardon for their offenses. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Take refuge, 
Let me never be put to shame In your justice rescues me Into your hands I command my spirit You will redeem me, O Lord O faithful God I am an object of reproach A laughing stock to my neighbors And a dread to my friends They who see me abroad flee from me I am forgotten like the unremembered dead I am like a dish that is broken Father, into your hands I command my spirit But my trust is in you, O Say you are my God In your hands is my destiny Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies And my persecutors Father Your face shine upon your servant Save me in your kindness Take courage and be stout-hearted All you who hope in the Lord Father to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we don't have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, in every way yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered and when he, was, when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The Word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns torches and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, also was, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he said, so he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let this man go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it, was, that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. 
one of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die, so Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the, uh, and the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus, so Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak, and he said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. 
And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast last for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I first. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it, up, put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And now, bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Please all kneel. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one, who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, but one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened, so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, They will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate, 
if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there, because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, especially to those who are one with us in this liturgy through Sambuhay TV Mass. I once imagined a death by chocolate or by car accident or drowning in the sea, but never had a thought of dying on a dental chair until I was scheduled for an impacted wisdom tooth extraction. But some days before that uh, dreadful day, Dr. Alice, the dentist, gave me a fair warning that it won't be a normal extraction, but rather a minor surgery. But then again, how minor is minor surgery? Her description of the procedure left me anxious. So I searched online some pertinent details about wisdom tooth removal. And I was both uh, consoled and horrified. Mr. Google informed me that almost all patients survived the surgery, but there were cases where patients died because of some complications during that minor surgery. And honestly, I wanted to cancel my appointment upon reading that article. But the next day, my wisdom tooth gave me another terrible headache that refused to go even after I popped in a couple of pain relievers. So off I went ahead with the procedure. But countless times during the surgery, I had to raise my hand to tell the dentist to stop, give my straining jaw some rest, and to inject another anesthetic into my gums. I actually had uh, six shots of that already, but I felt I needed more. The dentist cut my gums open, drilled the crown of my tooth that lay sideways, and forcibly lifted it up with elevators and forceps of various shapes and sizes. The dentist, a religious woman herself, asked for the intercession of the Pauline saints even while she was performing the surgery. And after three hours of what seemed to be an eternity, with tears slowly welling up in my eyes, my dentist took her final pull. She then held my tooth with forceps in front of my face, and she exclaimed, It's a boy! You know, I had some sports injuries in the past, and even fell off the back of the carabao many times when I was young, but I had never known physical pain of its worst kind until I was pinned on that dreaded gen dental chair and quote-unquote labored for three hours. And I swear to God I would never go through that hell hole again, ever. And much to my embarrassment, that was just a tooth extraction. Now I could not just imagine how much pain did Jesus endure 
during his passion. And if we zoom in further to what had transpired during that day, Jesus did not simply suffer physical torment, but he also sustained emotional trauma and spiritual agony. Yesterday, I watched for the nth time Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. And I could not help but recoil from every beating that Jesus received. And quite a few times, I have to pause the movie and look away as Jesus experienced the extreme limit of physical pain. You know, the soldiers scourged him while he was uh, chained to a pillar. They first grabbed him a wooden stick and beat him to a pulp until they themselves had to catch their breaths. And upon seeing that Jesus could still manage to stand, they took a whip with multiple leather cords with bits of sheep bone and sharp metal pieces embedded throughout. And every lash they made ripped Jesus' flesh and even exposed his skeletal muscles Jesus lost a lot of blood after they flogged him. And they did not simply crown him as if he were a king. They thrust the wreath of thorns into his head and struck him to drive the thorns even more or even deeper into his temples and forehead. And though already weakened and blooded with face and body beyond recognition Jesus was forced to carry a huge wooden cross all the way up to the Calvary and there at the Calvary he was nailed on the cross with only his wrist carrying the weight of his whole body his breathing was harsh and heavy for the next six hours until his lungs give away gave away to asphyxia or the failure of lungs to provide oxygen to his body. Well, to some degree, Jesus' death is similar to those who have succumbed to coronavirus. Doctors would say that the virus causes inflammation in the lungs, which makes it harder for the lungs to get oxygen to the organs of the body, which would then result to multi organ failure but physical suffering was just one dimension of what Jesus went through he also because he also suffered from something more acute something severe which was emotional and psychological pain we know for a fact that physical injuries or a chronic back pain or a toothache in my case are nothing compared to the emotional pain because emotional pain cuts us far deeper whenever we are accused of a wrongdoing we know nothing about or rejected by the persons we love even after giving them everything or betrayed by the people we trust or humiliated by the same people with whom we show kindness these moments pierce and rip and stop our hearts and sometimes it takes a lifetime for these wounds to be healed Jesus endured these emotional stabbings he was accused by the religious leaders they maligned him destroyed his reputation threw allegations at him and mock him Jesus suffered the traumatic pain of rejection he was rejected by Pontius Pilate he was rejected by the same Jewish crowds who lined the streets with palm branches and praised him. He was rejected by the people whom he taught, fed, and healed. He also experienced loneliness and isolation when his friends, his disciples, had socially distanced themselves away from him. They were nowhere to be found when Jesus was tortured by Roman soldiers. Jesus was emotionally 
devastated. And this search weighed him down even more as he hung on the cross. But wait, Jesus' pain did not end there though, because he also went through a deep spiritual agony. Even he himself felt that he was deserted by God. And thus he cried out desperately, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus suffered the excruciating pain of loss and loneliness and abandonment. He also went through that existential crisis, so to speak, of despair, of the lost sense of purpose and meaning in life. It's quite disheartening to hear some stories of those with uh, confirmed patients of COVID-19 who do not only experience physical pain, which they would describe as breathing with broken glasses in your lungs, but they also experience the psychological pain of extreme loneliness because their families are away when they need them most. And worse, some of them succumb to a deep spiritual crisis, that loss of connection with God, of spiritual abandonment. And sadly, a few of them had taken their own lives even before the vi virus totally get them. This afternoon, we remember Christ's suffering and death on the cross. But don't mistake of saying that the cross is just a story of pain and suffering. For if Christ's passion were just about pain and suffering, then Jesus is no less than a masochist. Or God the Father a sadist for letting his son get hurt. But no, Jesus' passion more than anything else is a love story. Jesus, fully human and fully divine, decided to enter into every bit of our physical pain, of our emotional trauma, of our spiritual crisis, and of our sin, and wrap them all up with love on the cross. You know, in our life, if only possible, we would like to avoid pain and suffering in all and in all its forms that's why some people don't want to trust others anymore just so we, we can be spared from being cheated i know some people who don't want to be in a relationship just so they could avoid the pain or rejection or being taken for granted again some of us would distract ourselves with all sorts of diversion just so we would never have to deal with the pang of loneliness. And as petty and ridiculous as it sound, sounds, I myself don't want to have another wisdom tooth extraction just so I would never have to go through that drilling pain again. But Jesus, in his self-sacrificing, self-emptying, and self-outpouring love, I believe he would not mind being rejected again. He would not back away from another scourging. He would not cut and run from another crucifixion just to tell us over and over again how much he loves us, just to show us how much we deeply mean to him. For Jesus, no amount of physical pain, no amount of emotional and psychological trauma, no amount of spiritual anguish could deter and discourage him from loving us through and through. Amen. Let us stand.
for the church. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and unite her throughout the world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout all the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. For the Pope. Let us pray for our most holy Father Pope Francis, that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishops may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, by whose degree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people governed by you, their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for Apostolic Administrator Broderick, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost, inmost hearts, and unlock the gates of His mercy, that having received forgiveness of their sins through the waters of rebirth, that you may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. the unity of Christians. Let us pray for all brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in His one church. Let us kneel.
let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Jewish people. Let us pray for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, Hear graciously the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us praise to the not believe in Christ that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, that you may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, Grant that those who do not confess Christ, that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love, and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray for do not acknowledge God, that following what is right with sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you, and by finding you come to rest, grant we pray that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray for those in public office that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to His will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, 
in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples. Look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that He may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, losing fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us step. Almighty ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For an end to epidemic, let us pray, dearly beloved, for a safe end to the coronavirus pandemic that afflicts our world, that our God and Father we heal the sick, Strengthen those who care for them and help us all to persevere in faith. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty and merciful God, source of all life, health, and healing. Look with compassion on our world, brought low by disease. Protect us in the midst of the grave challenges that assail us, and in your fatherly providence, grant recovery to the stricken, strength to those who care for them, and success to those working to eradicate this scourge. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the wood of the cross, on which hung the salvation of the world. Be 
behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Please all kneel. Yeah. 
At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy be for me protection in mind and body and a healing remedy.
we all kneel. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. You have communicated to me this life of yours. Now you nourish it by making yourself my food. Take my heart. Detach it from the vain things of the world. With all my heart, I love you above all things because you are infinite good and eternal happiness. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve, us, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly de devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Counting paalala lamang po mula ho sa Catholic Bishops Conference of the Philippines, ukol ho sa ating pagdiriwang ngayon ang uh, dakilang pagpapakasakit ng ating Panginoong Yesus. Una sa lahat, ang pinakapuso o diwa ng ating pagdiriwang ay yung mabuting, mabuting balita ukol sa pagpapakasakit ng ating Panginoong Yesus. So pagkatapos ho na mapakinggan ng mga miyembro ng pamilya itong mabuting balita na ito, eh maaari ho silang magkaroon ng sharing o reflection Ang bawat miyembro ng pamilya, if you have stories of sacrifices, you know, ano yung mga sakripisyo na gusto ninyong iugnay sa paghihirap at pagpapakasakit ng ating Pangunang Yesus, maaari hong magkaroon kayo ng sharing bilang isang pamilya. Ikalawa ho, yung pamilya, they can venerate the crucifix sa kanilang bahay. At ikatlo ho, any time of the day, ang mga miyembro ng pamilya, they're encouraged na magdasal ng Stations of the Cross na maaari nyo rin hong mapanood via Facebook. Ang Sambuhay TV Mass at ang iba pa hong, uh, you know, uh, iba pa hong uh, communities or churches, they have the Stations of the Cross. So you can pray that with your family members. With these activities, we are reminded of the experience of the early church when Christians gathered to worship at home. This is an opportune time that families pray at home. May you have a grace-filled celebration of the Paschal Triduum. 